Hey, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to talk about this topic that you have seen in the title above or below this video, however you're seeing this. But first, let's go and get the, uh, what's it called? Gorilla pod. It's like a tripod thing from the car. So I can actually stand this up and rather than holding this. So let's have a chat. Let's go grab that and then we'll have a chat. All right, let's do it. Here we go. Uh, it's really not the best setup. I do apologize for the lighting. I'm just relying on the natural light at the moment, the daylight, which is really nice, but obviously you can't really see the rest of the room. So I do apologize about that. So in this video, I wanted to talk about a topic that I think is pretty important. When you are starting out as a aspiring composer or just a, a hobbyist, <clears throat> just you know looking to start composing some music with orchestral sample libraries, you will usually start out with possibly the, all the free stuff, you know, like stuff that's in your door, your DAW. Like in Logic, I started with all the free orchestral sample libraries that are in there, and they don't sound amazing, obviously, because they're not profession, professional kind of level orchestral sample libraries or virtual instruments. However, you can kind of get started with them, and nowadays, the amount of freebies that are out there are absolutely incredible. Like, and not just the amount of free sample libraries that you can get started with, but the actual quality of some of these freebies that I'm, I'm sure plenty of you are aware of. So I won't go into depth uh, listing these uh, in this video. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, nowadays it's so easy to get into this kind of thing. You can just get started with a few sample libraries, a few free sample libraries, and get going creating some cool cinematic tracks, at least trying out some stuff like that. And then after a while, you might start to realize that this is something you want to pursue further, whether it's through online courses or your own personal study, or if you just want to become a, you know, really committed hobbyist and you want to do this as a hobby, well then you're probably going to be looking at some more detailed orchestral sample libraries. You know, you might buy an all-in-one sample library, something like a Nucleus Full Edition, you know, things like that where it's like you've got a full orchestra within one package and there are plenty of others that I haven't mentioned. There are some really good options out there. When you first get one of those all-in-ones, like I remember, I think it was either the end of 2017 or the, uh, the beginning of 2018 when I first bought my first all-in-one orchestral sample library and I was just blown away with these sounds with what I could actually create because it was like wow this sounds like real orchestral recordings like not really synthetic weird stuff going on it you know and like some of the free stuff I'd used in Logic but it sounds really professional and you know that was the way I, I ended up getting contact full because I did it as a cross grade from that sample library because it, and it required contact player but then there's a cross grade to contact full so I ended up getting that so I could use some of the freebies that require contact full. And that was the beginning of it, really. Then I ended up getting like smaller, you know, 50 pounds, 100 pounds sample libraries that are a bit cheaper, but they kind of went alongside what I was using, using obviously educational discounts because I was at uh, university, my third year of university at that point. And that was incredible. And I was just using these tools as much as I could. I was aware of the fact that these weren't the top of the top level of orchestral sample libraries or virtual instruments because to get to that kind of level you will be paying a lot more money because they're more detailed sample libraries you have individual sections you have so many dynamic layers and round robins and extended articulations etc 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 however that didn't bother me at that stage because i was just happy with what i had and it's kind of funny that with those limited tools, that was all I had. I, c I didn't have anything else. So I just had to work with what I had and just keep going forwards with that. But what I found anyway, I think around maybe the end of 2019, early 2020 and through 2020, and it's, I noticed something which I've been working on this year is that I started obsessing about things a little bit too much when it came to actually the, the gear and the sample libraries rather than actually just writing more music. So. Let's talk about that a bit more. Let's change the angle. So what I started noticing was that as I started building a bigger sample library collection out of necessity thinking, okay, so I'd really like to explore this more and create a better kind of virtual orchestra within my uh, template. So what can I do to expand that? And so that meant obviously getting a dedicated strings library, getting a dedicated brass library, getting maybe a brass library that would work in a different context for like, you know, hybrid orchestral trailer music, really powerful stuff, but then I would need something else for like the really softer chorale kind of brass writing. So what do I do with <laughs> all of these things? And, you know, slowly developing the collection, uh, starting to do pay bits of paid work. 
and obviously a lot of free stuff as well, starting to write library music and using these tools for that. So it's not like these, uh, it wasn't, I wasn't approaching it as a hobbyist, um, even from 2018, I, I really decided that this is something I wanted to pursue and make that into my career and that's what I wanted to kind of do because it just felt so right. Um, I can talk about this some other time, like my story of how I actually kind of accidentally found out that I wanted to do composing, even though I was on a completely different degree and it was on my third year of university that I discovered, oh, this is actually what I want, what I want to do. But that's a different story for another time. Anyway, so I was pretty serious about doing this and I thought, okay, I need to build out a good virtual orchestra because the all-in-one orchestral sample library that I had back then was just ensemble patches. You didn't have like, you know, violins one, two, violas, cello, double basses, etc. right? So I, I knew that that's where I needed to expand. But past the point of getting the kind of bread and butter orchestra sorted, I started adding different tools for different work, different jobs. And suddenly I thought, okay, <laughs> I have a lot of things now. I have multiple string libraries, multiple brass libraries, etc, etc. Et and I think you can, uh, some of you can probably relate to that. And at that point I was like, oh, what do I do? Do I use this one and this one? Because they both sound good, but it's fine having like, I, I would say, you know, when you're building your template, it's a good idea to have a few options, you know, maybe like have two to three main kind of brass libraries, same for the strings and the woodwinds. You could have just one, obviously, if you're just getting started, don't worry about having more than that. But, you know, for working for like a professional level uh, on paid work and stuff, and even though I'm just at the beginning of this kind of whole journey, I understand that it's good having those choices so that you, you might go to write something for a solo French horn and then realize this patch really isn't working for these kind of phrasings that I'm writing. Let me try that other one. Oh, that sounds, that actually works better. I'll use that and blend it in with the other sample libraries. So, uh, not blend in, but make it work with the other sample libraries. So, not layering two solo French ones. Anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, I get to the point where I noticed that in my template, I had four or five different string libraries. I had four different brass libraries for different things and like, two woodwinds even though I only really used one of them and you know just it was just so getting so massive and I started having this kind of what would you call it not like writer's block but it was more like this decision fatigue of <laughs> what do I start with like they all sound great which one do I use and then I would just end up overthinking those things rather than just writing music and it's something that I really recognized by the end of 2020 and then throughout this year 2021 I've been really focusing on okay what do I just need in my template it doesn't need to have absolutely everything but let's just aim for one to two sample libraries per orchestral section. So one to two woodwinds, one to two brass, etc., etc. Uh, for percussion, I use more because there's so many different little bits of percussion that you can use. That, in a way, feels a lot more freeing because you don't have everything that you own in your template. It's more, okay, here are a few select libraries that I use for each orchestral section. If I'm going to be working on something that's in a very specific genre, I do have that library. It's in my contact or whatever it is. I have it there and I can always load it into that template and make a project specific template based on my core template. And so that is what I'm going for now. And the template now is sitting around 400 to 600 tracks. Um, it's around 450 at the moment, but I think by the time I've ad added a few more things I want to to it, it's gonna be around 600. And for me, that's relatively small. Like my previous template, I was running around 800 to 900 tracks. Obviously, most of them were deactivated anyway, and I didn't end up using half of them. So what's the point of even having them there, you know? So that's just the kind of message I wanted to uh, convey in this video is that it's okay to not include everything you own even though you own certain things for this project but you don't use it like 90% of the time but you might use it once a year or twice a year well just don't have it in your template just have it somewhere <laughs> in storage and bring it out when you need to I would just encourage you to try and simplify your workload so try and simplify your template if you can in any way and just try and make it easier for you when you write music. Just use tools that you really know and that you really enjoy working with. Try and build your template around the tools that you use 90% of the time and just leave out the rest and, you know, save them. You know, okay, like for example, in my woodwinds folder, I do have a few ethnic woodwinds uh, patches in there, maybe about five or 10, but I don't, know, I don't need 20 or 30 in there, you know? Just have a few different instruments like that in there if you need them 
but don't put loads in there and then just load in what you need when it comes to very specific projects. Now, I just want to mention something here, okay? So when you're just getting started out and you just have a few sample libraries, a few virtual instruments, you're just getting started, don't worry about having to get absolutely everything and get hung up on the fact that you don't have the most detailed orchestra as you're starting out. Just really use the tools that you have at your disposal, whatever that is, whether you know, you, you've got the budget to buy a big all-in-one sample library, uh, all-in-one orchestral sample library, or you don't and you just can get freebies and smaller sample libraries, that's absolutely fine, you know? Just start where you can and make the best music you can using the instruments that you have at your disposal, the tools that you have, that you have access to, and become resourceful with the resources that you have at your disposal. And like I said, even if that's just using you know a bunch of different freebies that you can get and maybe cheaper sample libraries, that's fine. Just get started with that. Use what you can. If you have any live instruments, you know, real instruments that you have in your house or in your studio or whatever, use those, add them in, layer things, and just use the tools that you have to their absolute maximum potential that you can with your skill level. Because something I've noticed is some of the sample libraries that I had starting out, now several years later, as I'm doing more and more uh, work and writing more music and stuff like that, I'm noticing that some of the older libraries, there's a lot of stuff in there that I just hadn't utilized properly before and maybe I saw it in there but didn't really explore it properly and there are some really cool hidden gems in libraries that you might already own. So really dive deep into the libraries that you already have before you go trying to buy other stuff. The biggest things you should be focusing on is being the best composer you can, so looking at tutorials and courses or anything like that on improving your craft and your skills as a composer, just writing as much music as you can, listening to as much music as you can and picking out things, that, different tools and techniques that you want to try and use in your music, that kind of thing. So, you know, if there's different ways of writing sort of nice textures and flourishes in orchestral writing, then maybe you take that as inspiration to use in the background of some of your other pieces of music, things like that and then focus on getting as good as you can programming orchestral music with MIDI mockups and all of that kind of stuff. Getting as good as you can with that, with the tools that you have available at the time. Obviously, the more detailed the sample libraries are, the a little bit easier it is sometimes, um, getting a more realistic sound, but not always. So those two things, and three, I would say really, really learn the tools that you have and master them as much as you can before trying to get more stuff, you know? That's it really. If you have been through this kind of uh, process, uh, just let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from you what you've done to maybe help with this kind of problem that I'm sure most composers encounter at some point. And you know what? You might be someone who actually likes the workflow of having absolutely everything in your template that you might ever possibly need. If that works for you, then go for it. If you prefer working with a modular template that has pretty much nothing, but you have everything kind of pre-routed, you have your sends and reverbs and all of that set up so you don't have to do that, but you just load in libraries one by one per project, that's fine as well. If that's your workflow and it works, then go for it. I'm just sharing what works for me and hopefully it might help someone out there who's watching this. So that's it for this video today, quite a simple one. I hope you found it useful. If you did, leave a comment down below and give it a thumbs up as that helps it spread around YouTube and maybe some help some other composers. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.